Okay, well, in almost every single cell in our body is this stuff over here, which is called DNA for deoxyribonucleic acid. And that's where all the info is going to be stored. That's right there in that molecule. It's a big, long molecule. It has lots of repeating units. And uh, essentially, those units are labeled as A, T, G, and C, which indicate things called bases. And you can scramble this code and code for all the different things that makes up a human being. Now, what happens is the DNA is converted into a messenger because DNA is very large. It's carried on a whole bunch of chromosomes. Those are linear pieces of DNA. In fact, there's going to be 23 of those, 23 pairs of cr chromosomes, and the pieces of that DNA contain instructions to make stuff like hemoglobin, the stuff that carries oxygen in your blood. So let's say right over here we have a gene on the DNA, and what we're going to do is we're going to take that DNA and we're going to transcribe it to a very similar type of molecule, and that molecule is going to look like this. Yep, a squiggly green line, and that's called RNA, and that's for ribonucleic acid. That's right, RNA. And what happens is, is that RNA is going to be used to make some very, very cool stuff. And that cool stuff is going to be called proteins. That's right. And the process of going from RNA that we see up over here to proteins, which we see over here, is called translation. And we call it translation because RNA is very different from protein. So it's like translating it into another language. And the question is, what do these proteins do? Well, they do lots of stuff, but one of the things they can do is they can make muscle tissue. That's one thing they can do. And they can also make something called enzymes. Yay! Enzymes. What do those do? Well, those make reactions go faster, but we can have other enzymes or other molecules that make reactions go faster, slower, turn them on and off, and make all these different molecules that make up the metabolism. That's the stuff that our bodies do to live. And so basically, this is the, well, they used to call this the central dogma. They still do. And you go from DNA over here. Let me get a, a color here I want to work with. Okay, we'll go with orange. So you go from DNA, and then you go to RNA, and then you get down over here, and you go to protein. That's called the central dogma. And so that's kind of a cool deal, and now you're all experts on genetics. But here's the thing. We thought, we thought, when we were doing something called the Human Genome Project, which was a project to sequence all the genes, that's right, all the genes in the human body, that if we were able to sequence all those genes for one person, just one person, that would be having a complete a genome, that's all the genes in that one person, that we could figure out lots of cool stuff and prevent disease and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and guess what? We can't. <laughs> yeah, we can't. But, you know, 10 years ago, we were pretty sure we could, and now we're just kind of disappointed. Some people think that we still can, but most people think in the field that there are some other issues. Now, there are some a lot of issues, and a lot of the assumptions we made were incorrect because biology is complicated. But one, one of those biggies is called, here it comes, let me find a cool color for this, we'll make it pink, that's called epi, epigenetics. Epigenetics, and I don't spell too well, so that's the best I can do, and that means above genetics. And the way it works is, is that we uh, understood that in this stuff over here, this DNA stuff here, that we could control whether the DNA was transcribed by having various molecules bind to the DNA, and we thought that was the whole deal. But no, we found out that it's more complicated than that. You see, what happens is our DNA, remember that's that dark green stuff, so i got to make sure to use that same color. Okay, here we go. That DNA stuff is going to be wrapped around like this, little balls. And those little balls are made of protein. And let me go ahead and find the color for protein. We'll make protein blue. So those balls are going to be right over here. See that ball right there? Yeah. 
all of these here, wrapped up. And those balls, those are called histones. So those are called histone proteins. Histone proteins. And what happens is those histone proteins have lots of little thingies. Look at those thingies like this. And those thingies are going to be coming out of this little, these little balls here. And on those little thingies are going to be chemicals. And those chemicals can control how tightly the DNA is wrapped around these histone proteins. So for instance, there are two types of groups. One of them is a methyl group like this. And when you've got a methyl group bonded there, what it does is it makes all these things bind together really, really tightly. So you've got all these histones bound really, really tightly with the DNA like this, okay? And what happens is there's the DNA going all the way around this like this, and there's no way that this DNA can create RNA because it's bound too tightly. Remember this process that we have over here of transcription, that's to transcribe. That process will not take place if there's going to be these little red things here. Those are called methyl groups, and they make this bind super tight. On the other hand, there's another kind of group. Yes, there is. Let's make those uh, pick a nice color. Uh, I don't know. Yellow doesn't show up very well. Let's go with brown. That's a stinky color. Let's go with gray. That's better. Okay? So there's another kind that what happens is when you use that, oh, what the hell, let's call it an acyl group. That's what it is. So when you have acyl groups that are going to be bound like this, then the whole thing stretches out a lot. Like, let me show you how much it stretches out. You got like a histone there. You got another histone there, really far apart. And then the DNA is like all exposed. Like, look at this. See how the DNA is over here? It's like all exposed here, all exposed. And in this case, this can go forward to make RNA. Uh, and what that means is, is that genes can be regulated. That is, genes can cause expression not only by what binds to the DNA, but also what binds to the little squirrely things here, the little fingers on the histone proteins. And that's called epigenetics. And that's not coded for. That is something that we develop over time. Like if you take a lot of cocaine, the histones are going to change their modification. And what will happen is if you take lots of cocaine, it will permanently change those histone markings, so that your DNA is going to be open like this. See this here, over here? It's going to be open like this, so you're going to get a really a kick from cocaine and be readily addicted. And we're finding out that some of these changes are permanent. They're essentially irreversible, but we're working on drugs that might change that. But given regular environmental conditions, they're essentially irreversible. On top of that, we also found out, wow, look at all this room I got. We also found out that if you expose, that's a defect in the program there. You see this over here? I talked to them about it. They admit it. They screwed up, and they're trying to fix it. Okay, just because I told them to. But besides that, what happens is it's not just drug addiction. It's also depression, which, by the way, can be caused by taking a rat or a mouse. Let's make it a mouse so it can turn into a man. So let's see. I'm not a great... Uh, Drawer of mice. Let's see. God, it doesn't look like a mouse at all. That's a mouse, and you can put it in a cage with a bigger mouse like this, and the mouse will bully it. That's right. Bullying occurs in uh, across the mammalian community, maybe in other areas too. And so this is that bad mouse over here. Ah, I'm a bad mouse. And so what happens is that bad mouse keep bullying this mouse like this, and what will happen is over a period of time, they measure, they kill the mice, but they look at its brain. They see changes in these markings here. They see changing in the markings of their histone proteins. And what will happen is, is that they found out, they, they looked at over 2,000 genes in the reward center of the brain. They found modification over 2,000. And of those 2,000, they found, yes, they did, that 1,200 of these genes had these little funny things here you see this over here? Look up over here. That methyl group, what that does is it makes the histones bind real tight. And they found out that's associated with depression. Because what happens is 
the genes that are associated with activity and livelihood and things like having sex and eating sweet cookies and water and stuff like that, they start to shut down. The mice have like a really bad time. So the, the issue here is, is that we used to think that if we simply understood this code that you see over here, this code, the genetic code, we'd be able to work everything out. And, uh, well, that's worked in very limited cases. It turns out that it was more complicated than that. And one, not the only, but one of the big complications is this whole thing called epigenetics. And now you're an expert on this, and I hope you had a good time. Bye now.